Unique people leading unique lives shape and inform Iowa City. This community is enhanced by these women and men who live in our midst, working, teaching, creating. Welcome to a series of conversations with people who have stories to tell. Join my guests and me, Ellen Buchanan, in a series of interviews called One of a Kind. Well, hello, I'm Liz Mathis, and I am your fill-in host today for One of a Kind. It's a special edition of One of a Kind because our guest today is Ellen Buchanan, who has been the longtime host of One of a Kind. Ellen Buchanan first moved to Iowa City in 1960, and after two years, she moved away, returned for four years, and then moved away again, and returned back in Iowa City by 1970. Ellen is a philanthropist, she's a volunteer, a television host and producer, and dedicated to the arts, history, and the culture of Iowa City and the community. Ellen has a bachelor's degree in television and radio from the University of South Dakota and a certification in elementary education from the University of Iowa. Ellen served as public service director for four years for local radio station KCJJ where she first reviewed children books, children's books and later hosted a talk show. Ellen serves as host and producer of One of a Kind, a series of interviews produced for the Library Channel at the Iowa City Public Library beginning in 1993. She also hosted and produced a previous series, Tell Me Your Story, which is a series of 40 interviews from 1989 through 1992. The goal of these programs is to preserve local history through the stories of people within the community who have truly made a difference. In 1995, Ellen received the Irving Weber Award from the Johnson County Historical Society for her work on these series. In May of 2009, Ellen was recognized for her 20th anniversary of producing local history television programs for the Iowa City Public Library. Ellen's support of the Iowa City Public Library goes well beyond her work on One of a Kind. Ellen is past president and a longtime member of the Iowa City Public Library's Board of Trustees and continues to volunteer at the library presenting story times with her famous puppet, Bruce the Goose, who we will see later. Ellen Buchanan, along with her husband John Buchanan, has had an enormous impact on the community. Their contributions of time, leadership, and resources have benefited the University of Iowa and the entire Iowa City area. Ellen was a volunteer driver for Meals on Wheels, serving 10 years as a full-time driver, which takes a great deal of time, and another 10 years as a part-time driver. She served on the board of the School of Religion and served as its president. She was also the co-chairperson for the capital campaign for the expansion of the Ronald McDonald House in Iowa City. Within the Iowa City community, John and Ellen are also well known for their leadership and generous financial support. The Buchanans provided a high-level gift as a challenge match on behalf of the Iowa City Public Library during the construction of the new library that opened in 2004. In honor of this gift, the children's room at the Iowa City Public Library was officially named the Ellen Buchanan Children's Room. In recognition of their admirable history of service, Ellen and John were named Outstanding Philanthropists by the Eastern Iowa Chapter of the National Society of Fundraising Executives in 1991. In 1996, Ellen and John received the Distinguished Service Award from the University of Iowa Alumni Association, and in 2004, received the Service to Mankind Award from the Old Capitol Sertoma Club. In honor of her 100th 
local history interview for the Library Channel, the Iowa City City Council proclaimed December 15, 1999, Ellen Buchanan Day in Iowa City. Ellen has three children, two stepchildren, and 13 grandchildren. Ellen Buchanan, welcome to One <laughs> of a Kind. Oh my Thank goodness, you. what you. a resume, Ellen. And thanks for doing this, Liz. That's oh, <laughs> it is a pure pleasure. And a pure ple pleasure to read that bio. My goodness, you have done so many things for this community. But really, let's start at the beginning, shall we? Okay. Let's do it from the very beginning. Uh, your story begins in 1938 okay. in Aberdeen, South Dakota where you were born and raised. Obviously, your parents were Merton and Gladys, who met in college and both graduated from Carleton College. And you have five siblings. So mm -hmm. tell us about your first family. Well, my father was a teacher, uh, taught math and physics, and then went to the University of South Dakota, where he taught astronomy and math. And in fact, he taught German in high school, and I had him for a German teacher uh, one year. And my mother was an English teacher, and, uh, but she was always busy with the children uh, for, to begin with. And then later, about 11 years, when I was 11, uh, my younger brother and sister were born. So she was very busy, but she would practice teach. And, um, and my five siblings are all scattered through the United States, but all have interesting paths. Uh, from a curator at the Smithsonian, my brother, to a poet in Minneapolis, to a marathon runner in Kansas City, an artist in Kansas City, and a businessman in South Dakota. And I'm the only one in Iowa, though. <laughs> well, what a genetic mix, though. You yeah, know, your we father are. came from science and math yeah. and languages, and your mother from English. Mm -hmm. It must have been great conversations around the family dinner table. It was. My father was uh, 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 believed in memorizing and um, just was our walking encyclopedia. We could ask him any question, and he somehow had done so much reading in his uh, life that we could he could come up with the facts and of course my mother's love of of writing and literature and um, she she would read it's like an old Norman Rockwell painting but it's really true she had made these braided rugs and we would sit there in the evening of course this was before television and she would read us uh, Treasure Island uh, kidnapped with those wonderful illustrations by Andrew Wyeth's father, N.C. Wyeth, absolutely wonderful illustrations, and Little Women and The Yearling, and so um, that was a, a wonderful gift that uh, she did. Oh, terrific gift. Now, your siblings, you say, are in all of these different careers. Could you tell when they were younger what they might be doing as they mm. got older, or was it a surprise to you, the careers I, they well, I think my older sister was always artistic and um, I don't know. We all had piano lessons. That, even though we had very little money, I don't know where my mother and father got money, but we all had piano lessons. But just my brother, younger brother, is the one who took off on the piano, and he's the one who's the curator of American jazz at the American, it's the Smithsonian. So, uh, and then the writing, the, the youngest one in the family, Margaret, Margie as we call her, she inherited the uh, writing gene. So. And you, the presentation and the writing gene well. as well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they probably shoved you forward when speeches had to be made. Well, I, uh, maybe speeches, but I'm not a writer. I'm really not a writer. Well, you, stories are a theme of your life, it seems. Um, and how did your first family contribute to your love of stories? Well, just like I said, the reading. You know, we always had books and going to the library. We all can remember the first time we went to the. Aberdeen Public Library and got our library card and I, probably at that time we could only check out two books you know here the Iowa City Public Library now you can check out a whole stack of books for your children or grandchildren so it was it was that um, and then my mother had had made these marionettes that I still oh. use of the three billy goats gruff and all my kids know because I used to do it for their birthday parties but they're the most darling little billy goats and the troll. And when I brought these billy goats that my mother had made, you know, this was, my goodness, in the 40s, um, the troll is so scary. So a couple times little kids when I've gone to preschool said, oh, oh, no, no, put that, put the troll back in the box. And anyway, so she would do that at schools, my mother. So I got that kind of performance oh, yes. from her. Did you ever help her with that? Did no, you ever? I, I was, no. 
No, I was too young. So. But at least modeling, so you sure. saw what she did, right. and then and I'm, not, I'm I'm holding the marionettes, but they travel around to my siblings because they use them for their grandchildren. Oh, so. how wonderful! Yeah. What a great heirloom of your family, great memories of your mother and father. Well, you attended uh, school at the University of South Dakota. I did. And how did you become interested in broadcasting then? Well, as I said, you know, I grew up before television, and radio was one of my most favorite things to do. I remember having to come home on a Saturday morning from a slumber party to clean house, but I would <laughs> put on Let's Pretend, which was this wonderful series of... Um, uh, folk tales and fairy tales and acted out and oh I'd clean house and listen to that or <laughs> in the Sunday afternoon there'd be the shadow and Jack Benny and it was just the high almost the highlight of my day was radio so I've always loved I still love radio I'm a passionate uh, public radio listener and um, it's just I love to listen to books on I'm, I'm a very audible person that way so um, so I decided I really, my father kind of was thinking maybe teaching or nursing. <laughs> yes. I really course. wanted to be in, in television was just at its very infancy. And so we did some closed circuit television shows. I was in oh, a couple plays and, um, but, but radio was big. And so at that time I went to the radio station and I said, I'd like to, there's not a lot of things on for children. So I said, I'd like to um, adapt, write, adapt folk tales called, and we did a series called Tales to Tell. I produced it, wrote many of them, got my mother to write and a couple of my friends, and then I'd get actors and actresses to act and then with a great sound effect, you know, the creaking door, creaking doors and clopping of, you know, horses and, and put all the sound effects together. And so we did a quite, I think maybe 30 of these and they were, um, uh, you know, things that kids could listen to on Saturday morning. And it was on our public radio station at the University of South Dakota. How very progressive for the time, Ellen. I know. You know, let, let me go back a little bit. When you told your father and your mother, this is what I'd like to do, I'd like to go into broadcasting, I mean, really, that was revolutionary for a female to do that. Mm -hmm. And secondly, a new industry, and especially when they would have rather you'd been a, a teacher or a nurse, right. something that was um, more of a, you know, a, a normal at that time career. So do you remember the conversation you had with your parents about that? I think they were so busy with all the children that, you know, <laughs> I was just one of many. To shove yeah. you out the door. Yeah, just, just yeah, go. Ellen, Ellen I survive I've out got there. other problems. I, I don't, I know, I don't remember, you know, ever being, oh, you should, well, then I ended up, you know, my father was deceased, but I ended up getting a degree, a certification in elementary ed, so I kind of did what he was hoping I would do is to become a teacher, but I didn't teach. But the threads so fold into what it was that you were doing with your presenting, mm -hmm. you know, on radio at the time. When you did this, and it was an idea that you just had in your head, um, do you think anything, uh, you know, you said you listened to The Shadow and those sorts of things on radio. W was any one show an influence in... Let's pretend. It was that was Let's fairy pretend. tales that on, on um, Saturday morning that I listened to faithfully every Saturday. It was Cinderella, yes. and, you know, all the great little prince, all the great uh, fairy tales. So... Yes. It was that story. But I had so much fun getting actors, you know, who yeah. didn't mind coming to on, and they loved being on the radio. And there was something unique about the University of South Dakota. Two of my classmates, my narrator for my series, Jim Randall, went on and had a sterling career at WGBH in Boston. He had a beautiful voice, beautiful voice. And then my other friend went on and is it's still working in um, television in uh, Los Angeles area. So, um, do you ever talk to them at all about? I no. I mean, I I hear from the, the woman. I don't know what happened to the the gentleman. I would have thought that your professors would just think that that was so unique. I'm sure you got straight A's for that. Oh, of course. No, I don't remember. <laughs> how progressive, very progressive. So, now let's switch a little bit to how you've been involved in the community. Uh, which one or two areas of service 
do you think have really been, have meant the most to you and maybe have meant the most to the community? Well, I'll, I'll personalize it. I, I think the library um, has made such a difference in my life. And I always quote um, Ramsey Clark, who used to be the, I think, Attorney General years ago. Anyway, he said that the library is a memory palace. And I, I think that is so wonderful about libraries. But it's much more than that. But my association with, happens to be this public library, has, has made all the difference in the world to me. And um, it's, I started years ago at the old Carnegie, which is Caddy Corner yes, from here. Yeah. And Hazel Westgate was a children's uh, librarian. And dear Hazel loved Bruce the Goose, too. She had a thing about geese, too, <laughs> the two of us. And so I did a lot of flannel board stories at the beginning over there at the Carnegie with that wonderful mural by the artist Ellie Simmons. Now, when you say flannel board, the old flannel the old board that you'd, fashion, you'd yes. put things up. And, and I did that. Stuff. I had that for my, you know, when I was in Sunday school years and years ago. So that kind of, and Hazel liked that. So I would tell stories of that. And now I've expanded. When we moved over here, I have lots more puppets <laughs> besides Bruce. I have a snake and I have a witch and I have a flamingo. So I've moved more from flannel board to, to puppets, but I still do uh, occasionally now story hours. And I used to do story hours in Coralville at the public library. So that association, and then my uh, the library willing to take a chance on me when I went to Lolly Eggers when she was the director uh, right before Susan, and I said I've got this idea because I had um, I retired from the radio station, which was a very brief um, time I was with KCJJ. I said I've got this idea. I'd like to. There's so many great people in Iowa City with a story to tell. Everybody has a story to tell. Some people don't think they do, but they mm -hmm. really do. And mm -hmm. so I said, I'd like to get them videotaped. And, and, and Lolly said, that's great. And what can we do? And Public Access Television had their studio uh, in the back of the library. And so Public Access, R Renee, and I can't remember some of the other uh, people who worked there were wonderful. And that's where I started with Tell Me Your Story. And so I did kind of people that everybody knew, you know, Hayden Fry and George Farrell and people that I knew, uh, Jerry Newsom, great storyteller and educator, Dorothy Moeller and oh. Bill Summerwell and, and uh, Hunter Rawlings. And uh, so I did 40 of those. And I thought, you know, I want to not just have people that everybody knows. I want the crossing guard at Hoover. I want John uh, Abelhasky at John's Grocery. I want the guy who runs the concession, the train, he wore his little train uniform. I want Jim Ebert, who is a great mountain climber and had uh, a mountain climbing uh, business. So I switched it from tell me your story to one of a kind. So, so interesting how oral history plays such a great role here in that piece of the puzzle that needs to be here at a public library. Um, so w when you were interviewing some of the more notables, like Hayden Fry, what part of his interview do you remember um, surprised you? Or, or maybe some of the other notables along the way. Do you carry with you any piece of information Hayden. or any advice that Hayden or any one of your celebrities, your early celebrities might Well, have? Hayden, it was so funny. I worked so hard to get him <laughs> and the only way I got him is that my nephew was dating a young woman in the athletic department and she was in pre-med and and I kept writing him and she finally <laughs> kept putting my request and so I thought the cutest part what made me feel quite good when he came in when I introduced myself to take him into public access television studio I said, well, thank you so much. I know how busy you are. Uh, and he said, well, I'm going to tell my football players about you. And I said, you are? And he said, you're the most persistent person. <laughs> you just wouldn't give up. So I think he just did it to get me off his back because I kept writing him. And he was absolutely charming, oh, the, which is no surprise. So, oh. But I don't want to pick out any. I mean, they've all been a treat and um, 
uh, privilege to listen to people's stories, and uh, it's it's been it's been wonderful. It's enriched my life and greatly. But you asked me a, a couple things uh, a while back about what what's been important to me. Yes. And I was, you know, I love delivering Meals on Wheels, and I just want to put a plug in that the Meals on Wheels program here in Iowa City is just great. And if you want to share a route, you can. And I hope people will call. They need drivers. But but the thing, my friend Melanie Hoppert and I, um, was it like 20 years ago, there were three Laotian children who lived <clears throat> in a trailer court on off Dubuque Street. And we wanted to introduce them to the library. So we would pick them up and we got them library cards and they learned to use the computer and every week they would check out books and then the next week bring them back and take. And we did that for about a year. And then we decided, I think they really need to learn to swim. You know, that's a skill you, you just never know when you're going to be <laughs> by a pond or a river. And so sure. we took them to the wonderful recreation center here and, and gave them lessons. And that, um, that, uh, by doing that, I don't know, that meant a lot to me. Um, mm -hmm. That was important to me that I did that. Making so, a difference in a child's life. Well, it just was, I think, it was something I felt was important to do. Mm -hmm. I just love turning people, children, onto books and libraries. Mm -hmm. I do, it's my mission to getting kids interested in books and reading, I think. Well, in social work, they call it static and dynamics. You may not be able to change uh, the family that a child is born into, but you, you can change some of the things around them, like shelter, uh, transportation, food, those types of issues. Mm -hmm. it, it sounds like you and Melanie were able to do that to change a child's life in terms of access to I don't to know the if library. it changed our life, but I think they did like books and lo loved oh. working on the computer. I don't know if it changed their what lives. What a tremendous difference. But it, well, but you're it was, being humble. No, I'm not. I'm not. I don't know if it, but it was important to us. You know, so maybe it was a selfish thing that we did, so to, because it meant something to us. And Meals on Wheels, isn't that a, um, you know, when you go out to deliver a meal to an elderly mm -hmm. person, it's a shut-in. People who can't yes. leave their homes. And, yes. Yeah, so. And it's such a, um, a renewed, it renews your spirit. Mm -hmm. in, Bobby uh, Stebbins and I someone. shared a route for quite a few years, and when she was out of town, I'd do it. So it's, it's a nice shared volunteer uh, thing to do in, in a town this size with the people look forward to it, and, and it's a really good oh, food. And so, sometimes you anyway. might be the only person that they mm -hmm. see, you know, in a given week or a day. Certainly. Right. So, um, now you've talked about a couple of people that you've interviewed, but in your personal life, who has influenced you? Well, I was asked that a while back. For there was the library in Hills Bank did a um, session and asked different people to talk about who influenced them, and I was thinking about that the other day, and I don't think it's changed much. I, I mentioned an author, a friend, and of course a relative, and um, the author at one time when my mother was dying, and uh, before her, very young, before her 70th birthday, and I was going through a personal crisis, somebody gave me Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning, and he was a Viennese psychologist, but he had survived a con the concentration camps. But what, what I remember about, besides the horrendous ordeal he went through, was that he said, the last of the human freedoms that may be taken from you is your, your ability to choose your attitude about what life has handed you. And John, my husband, in his entrepreneurial class would always tell the kids, it isn't so much what happens to you, it's what you do about what happens to you. It's what you do. And Frankel said that we, that we have the ability to have our attitude a certain way. Nobody can tell us how our attitude can be toward what life hands us. And I thought that was, uh, for me, that was really, I needed to hear that at that time. And then he also went on about that people need meaning in their lives. And he went on to say that you find meaning by doing deeds, experiencing values, and suffering. And the book has meant a lot to, a, this book, to a lot of people throughout. But he's now deceased. He died like at 92, but he always get letters from people. And then I have a friend, Marilee, who uh, in her journey of um, her self-discovery and has taught me a lot about um, uh, owning all our parts that we all are, you know, different sh dark and light parts and that, uh, it's like 
you know, in, I don't know if you've read any Harry Potter, oh, yes. but Harry and Lord Voldemort, or he sh Voldemort, who shall not be named, both their wands shared the same feathers from the phoenix oh. bird. So there is dark and light in us all, or you can call it shadow material. And that there's no, and then she was also challenged and made me look at life in a new and fresh way. We need people like that in our lives, don't we? Mm -hmm. How did you meet her? Um, I met her through mutual friends, and uh, anyway, and she, it always reminds me, because she kind of lives that way, it's, um, I'm a collector of quotes, but <laughs> Goethe said, if everyone sweeps in front of their own door, the whole world will be clean. Hmm. And, you know, and <laughs> anyway, she reinforced that. And then the third person, of course, is, is was my mother. And uh, I, when I've interviewed people, many times it is their parent or a teacher or a brother or, or an uncle. And it, my mother, she taught me the uh, value of words and books and poetry and um, and, keep, and keeping writing down. I'm kind of like to write things so I don't forget. Every, at the end of every year, I write what a year it was and I kind of go through the year and think, what did I do? And because I, it's gone then, it's just, for mm -hmm. me it is. Mm -hmm. I, it's, you think, what did I do last because year? Because you're on to the next thing. I know you're on to the, the next, next thing. And it makes yes. me through her influence, makes me own my days and name them. And, um, and she was very courageous when she was dying. She taught me a lot about living and dying. So, and she had a generous spirit, so. On that same line then, who are your heroes and your heroines? Same people or well, someone it, different? It, um, you know, hero is such a big term. It is. And, and it can be a, a small, it doesn't have to be a big person, but mm -hmm. I, think the world of Dr. Paul Farmer, who is a medical anthropologist and a physician, an epidemiologist, and he has gone to third world countries, mainly Haiti, and has treated people with, who are so poor, but he treats treatable diseases, and he goes all over Haiti, and he started this big clinic, and then he and four other people started an organization called Partners in Health, and I think it was in 85 or 87, and it's made such a difference. And now he's expanding it to Chile and other third world countries, and he thinks that it's, it's a moral issue that yes. everyone, doesn't matter what you have, you have access to medical help. And so Dr. Paul Farmer, and I think a graduate of the Ira Writers Workshop wrote a wonderful, that's how I was introduced to him, it's called Mountains Beyond Mountains by Tracy Kidder. And it's a wonder, I highly recommend it. And it's about him going to Haiti with Dr. Farmer and following around. And then uh, he'd gone to, he's brilliant. He went to Duke and summa cum laude and any Paul Farmer. But anyway, it's a great book. And then the other, the other person I, found, um, I find, and he's still living, is Ignacio Pancetti, who oh, yes, is an Dr. orthopedic Pancetti. surgeon, mm -hmm. and he, for 60 years, uh, tried to explain and tell surgeons through the world and the United States that to treat club foot non-surgically is the way to go. And they ignored him and said, oh yeah, it works for farmers in Iowa, but in he just doggedly kept at it, that a, a non-surgical way of casting and then a brace is the way to go, and they have such a much better outcome. And, um, and if, you're, if you're operated on, you have a terrible outcome. And so he's, uh, he's a hero to me, that he's hung in there and steadfast and, steadfast and still sees patients, and uh, he's an amazing, human being. And my husband's gotten very, John has gotten very involved in uh, the Clubfoot project too. So, And he's an icon. He's he an is. Icon. He definitely is. Now I know you've met Dr. Ponsetti several times. He's a friend of yours. And Dr. I've interviewed Paul him. Farmer. Now is he from Iowa City? No, where no, is no. He, where he, he's he from? grew up, he, I think he was born in Massachusetts and he grew up in Florida. And, um, but he's a friend of the writer. This, I love Love connections. Mm -hmm. Love connections mm -hmm. of uh, Ethan Kanan, 
the writer and who lives who teaches at the writers workshop and uh, I think they were at, they were at Harvard together and um, they keep in contact in fact Ethan when I wanted to after I finished mountains beyond mountains he said well I've got his email would you oh. like to email so I sat down and told him how much I loved the story oh. and and so incredible about partners in health and lo and behold you know, he was in Haiti, and he sent me back an email, and he sent me a, a letter that he had written to Colin Powell oh about health care anyway. <laughs> so uh, anyway, so thanks to Ethan and that connection. So, Oh, maybe you'll be able to meet him someday. I would love to. He yes. is totally a hero to me. So heroes. Now, what would people be surprised to know about you? that I love poetry. My, my friends know that, but maybe people who don't know me that I love and I memorize poetry. It's from my childhood. We memorize our whole family. Many of us in the family do. I, I read poetry. I buy poetry books. I have favorite poets and I... Well, tell me about some of them. What, what Favorite poets? What kinds of poetry do you like? Well, and what, who are your I, favorite my poets? favorite poet, I have two favorite, po three favorite poets. So I uh, don't bore people, but Stanley Kunitz, who lived into in his 90s, um, is an amazing poet. His later poetry, I absolutely find. Uh, I have a, I have his copy by my bedside. I turn to him for solace, and he's uh, his later poems are just amazing and brilliant. And then, of course, I've always loved Emily Dickinson. Oh yes, I just deep, rich, yeah. It just, yes. I love Emily Dickinson. And, and then my sister, Margaret, Margie Hassey. I love her poetry. She just had her third poetry book called Milk and Tides come out. And it's a wonderful, it's about parenting and aging. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I would say, I mean, I've got other poets I read. I, mean, I love Billy Collins. I love Donald Hall. But those are my three favorites, if I had to choose. It's hard, but I had, if I had to choose, that's what I'd choose. Does she write about themes about family? Do you see mm -hmm. your name in no, there anywhere? I'm not, no, she's <laughs> never had my, I've never been in her poems, but there are family issues in there, of course. Issues Why not? Themes. Well, um, be, besides family and stories in libraries, what are your other interests? Well, I love to bike in the summer, and uh, I bike a lot in the summer. I walk every day. I do yoga, and I love to cook. And what is your favorite dish to pre prepare as oh, you prepare? I don't know. It changes. <laughs> you know, Doesn't it? 30 yeah. years ago, who'd ever heard of arugula and goat cheese? But now, you know, everybody, so it, it changes. But I've, I've uh, compiled two cookbooks over the years oh, for my you? children and grandchildren. And uh, I have so many grandchildren that uh, it's nice for them, especially the older ones, that they can have some recipes that I've cooked for them over the years. Oh, wonderful, Ellen. And a lot of my kids love to cook, so and that's just, it's wonderful. So anyway, I like to cook. And of course, wine. Mm -hmm. and drinking yes. some wine occasionally. That's good. Now, how did you meet your husband, John? John is so well known in the Iowa City community, too. You're like the power couple. No, certainly. no, no, no. The influential no. Don't couple. say that. Don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I met him through story. Can you oh, believe did you? that? Really? Yes, oh. I was at that time attending St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church. It was in 1978, and I was giving the children's sermon. Pro I don't. Re I think it was probably the prodigal son because it is my favorite. Bible did he story. come up to the front and sit no, with the rest of the no, children? No, 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 no. He didn't. But he evidently told me that he oh. looked at the program and he saw my name, and some of his friends had said to call me. So he finally put a face to a name, after, and I, that afternoon he called me and asked to go if I'd like to go to Coco and Carol's, which used to be a traditional thing at Hancher. Sure. So anyway. And, that was, so, and that's the end of the story, or the beginning of the story, really. That's the beginning really. of the story. And, and so, we combined uh, two families, and so we have five children. Uh, I brought three into the marriage, and he brought two. And then we have 13 grandchildren. And you truly do things together. I mean, you are truly um, well, symbiotic in your in well, the ways that Well, we have similar interests. I mean, yes. library has been mine, but he's been supportive. And um, Ronald McDonald, we, we both just think so much of, and uh, Ed Zastro at Ronald McDonald House. And um, the club foot, that's his kind of 
push right now is, is to do as much as he can to eradicate club foot being surgically treated around the world, that anybody who can, can be born with club foot can be treated, and that's his passion right now after he finished teaching. So, um, yeah, we have our different interests, but we have similar interests too, so they're very compatible. And John's just a brief uh, bio on him, a uh, successful businessman. Um, we might recognize his name tied to the University of Iowa School mm -hmm. of Business. Mm -hmm. And he taught for 10 years, or 10 or like, he kind of gave back in the entrepreneurial department, which was wonderful. And he was a really good teacher and very enthusiastic. And a great and, speaker, yeah, too. Yeah. I mean, when he gets in the front of the room, stands up in front of the room, he always has something interesting mm -hmm. to talk about. You have three children, mm -hmm. as you've mentioned, and two step grand, mm -hmm. or two stepchildren, mm -hmm. and then 13 grandchildren. And they live all over. Yes. Our, our eldest is Brad Buchanan, and he lives outside of Cedar Rapids, and he's a farmer and a crop consultant and a seed dealer, and three children, and... Uh, uh, Eric is the eldest and is also into um, seed dealing and helping his dad. And his uh, Kristen, uh, my granddaughter, is married and has so we have a great grandchild, oh my goodness. Callie, and they live in Seattle. And Ryan is now helping his dad; just graduated from Upper Iowa. And uh, so that's that family. And then Todd Buchanan. They all went to West High at, in Iowa City, which is kind of fun. And Todd Buchanan is a Pulitzer Prize winning photojournalist oh. and now is doing more um, uh, photography for business journals in Minneapolis and he and Kathy have two children, Michael and Matthew. And Todd has traveled all over the he world is. with his photography. Yes, he has. He's a wonderful photographer. And, um, and then Kristen uh, McFarland Reynolds it lives in Iowa City and is a research consultant for the Quarter Business Journal and her husband Mark works for the university in IT and they have twin uh, boys, oh, uh, Luke and Jack, identical twin boys. And um, then the next one in line is Grant McFarland and his wife Lizzie and he's a trial lawyer, mostly product liability, also a West High graduate and they have three children, Mia, Sarah and TJ. And where do they live? They live Here? in San Antonio, oh, Texas. San Antonio. Love, they love Texas. Oh. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and then the youngest, Andrew, who's also a West High graduate, and his wife Tracy have a, their own standalone restaurant in Kingman, Arizona called the Phoenix Grill. And they have three children, Lucas, Brooke, and Logan. So that's a bunch. <laughs> oh my goodness. Do you get together in the holidays? Have you all been together at once? Only for an occasion? once when they dedicated the children's room. And oh. the only we had one person out of this whole mix missing. It was our granddaughter Kristen and she just couldn't get back. She was oh. so far away. But everybody else was there and that's the, the last time. We I mean everybody's so busy right now and but there are these grandchildren are Wonderful children. Oh, what a wonderful legacy for your family. I mean, when you look at them, you must be very proud. I am. I'm very proud of them. Ellen, thank you so much for sharing all of this information with us today. Thank you, Liz. And thank you from the Iowa City community for 100 plus <laughs> interviews. That takes quite a bit of time to do that, <laughs> but how insightful. Um, and very, very good for the community to see and hear what it is that everyone else is doing to make it such a community. And thanks for taking your time to do this. Oh, you're welcome. I'm honored. <laughs> Thank you. Well, our special guest on One of a Kind today is Ellen Buchanan. Ellen is a philanthropist, volunteer, radio and television host and producer, and is passionately committed to the arts and culture of Iowa City. Words to describe Ellen are generous in giving of self, passionate, funny, persistent, articulate, loyal, trustworthy, energetic, a good friend, inquisitive, and a lover of poetry. As one good friend said, the world is a better place because of Ellen. Ellen Buchanan is truly one of a kind. Thanks for joining us.